Welcome to 3ABN's Fall Camp Meeting, Homecoming 2016. Good morning yet again. Good morning. And I'm sure that you have been vociferously welcomed. <laughs> so I will not take much more time. If you're not welcomed by now, then you won't be welcomed. <laughs> Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Jonah. There are only four chapters, and we want to consider the last of the four. So that would be Jonah chapter four. And I want to read the last verse in the book of Jonah. And that will set the stage for what we want to talk about. Shall we pray? Father God, there is so much in your word for us. It is so wonderful and deep and wide. Help us, dear Lord, again as we open your word to understand your will for our lives to prepare ourselves to take one more step along that road that leads to glory. For surely we would hear a word from the Lord this day. And we thank you, dear Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pick it up at verse 10 and 11, which are the last two verses in, um, in the book. The Bible says, but the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow which came up in a night and perished in a night and should I not pity Nineveh that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons I'm reading from the New King James who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock. His name means dove, D-O-V-E, dove. Now there are a number of theories, almost as many as there are theologians, as to how that applies to this man. In Bible times, names meant a lot. And the name, as a rule, had something to do with the character of the person, how they related to heaven and how heaven relates to them. So this name, Dove, is an interesting name for this man, Jonah. In Hosea chapter 7, verse 11, Ephraim is a synonym for the 10 northern tribes. And Ephraim is also called a dove, easily deceived and senseless. So we get a little clue as to how Hosea is viewed by God. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible says Ephraim is chained to his idols, just leave him alone. So there are some theologians that equate this name dove to chicken. Yeah, that kind of chicken. <laughs> like when you say, I dare you, chicken. And if we look at, if we look at Jonah's life, it kind of fits. Because among other things, he was chicken. And we get to see that in just a little bit. The evidence for that is not sure. So a lot of this is speculations and theologians do a lot of speculating sometimes when they don't have hard evidence. But it is interesting that his name would be called Dove. Not something exalted like Hosea, which means salvation or God has saved. Dove. Why would you call a guy Dove? Unless he's chicken. 
Most scholars say that the book is written by the man whose name it bears, and if it was, then he wasn't really that much chicken because it takes a lot to talk about yourself the way Jonah talked about himself in his book. Now, we all know the story of Jonah and the whale. And of course, there is some theological debate about Jonah and the whale because most scientists will tell you that whales are so built that they can't swallow people. Although they are the largest of the animals, whales eat by straining small bits of food through their baleen and they have very small throats. So even if they could get their mouth open wide enough to swallow a man, he could never get down the throat because though they're big animals, they have very small throats. Well, what the scientists forget is that God can do anything he wants. So if God can prepare a fish with a big mouth, um, I mean, you've got a lot of people <laughs> with big mouths. Mm-hmm. So if he can prepare people with big mouths, then you can have a fish with a big mouth. God can do whatever he wants. Amen. amen. I said amen. amen. That's what I said. <laughs> so today I want to take a look at Jonah in just a slightly different context. I want to see Jonah as a metaphor for Laodicean Adventism. Mm -hmm. I think in looking at the story of Jonah, if we just look at it as an isolated incident in the Old Testament, we miss the import of the book because really there's a lot in Jonah that looks a whole lot like what we see in the mirror every morning. It's a metaphor for Laodicean Adventism. In light of the Great Commission, this sometimes listless attitude that we have towards evangelism and our relationship with God is bespoken in the book of Jonah. The story of Jonah is then our story. Um, last night, Pastor Ivor said that we are Joseph. This morning, I'm telling you, you are also Jonah. Jonah is an anti-hero. We don't often see it, but the book of Jonah is the preeminent missionary book in the Old Testament and other than the book of Acts, perhaps the whole Bible. But Jonah is not someone that we should hold up as a role model. He is an anti-hero. This book highlights, among other things, God's desire to share the message with everyone. It tells you why God calls a people, a church, or a person. There was never ever a time, brothers and sisters, when God did not want to save the whole world. Old Testament and new. God has never been exclusive. He's never been one who didn't care. Evangelism is not a New Testament phenomena, it's a God phenomena throughout the, book of, of, of the books of the Bible. Just like the commandments existed before Mount Sinai, just like the division of clean and unclean animals existed before Leviticus 11, the active targeting of missionary activity to people of heathen communities did not originate with Christ's Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Elijah and Elisha had ministries outside of Israel. They had ministries to heathen people. Two senior figures in the Old Testament spent significant amounts of time trying to evangelize the wider non-Jewish community. It is a mistake to think that God doesn't love them as much as he loves us. Amen. I said amen. Amen. That's what I said. <laughs> Jonah was called to minister to a people who were not only non-Jews, but they were enemies of the Jewish nation. Now that's tough to go and share God with people who hate your guts. 
but that's what he was called to do. A hundred years after Jonah's mission, Assyria destroyed the ten northern kingdoms. It disappeared in 722 BC and did not reappear until AD 1948. Three millennia. But the truth is, brothers and sisters, God doesn't hate anyone. Amen. Amen. God loves everyone. God is no respecter of persons. And I keep having to say this because there are those who hold this, this atavistic thought that because you are vegan, you are more acceptable with God. Being vegan doesn't bring you closer to the Lord. Amen. 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 God loves everyone. God is a God of love and mercy. And God is not willing that any should perish. God calls out a people so that those called out people can call out people by calling others. Amen. amen. I said amen. amen. That's what I said. God calls you to call others. That's why you are called out. You are called out to call out. And if the called out don't call out, there is no reason for being called out. I'm not called out here to sit and say amen. Amen called out to call all this out. It is the purpose of God that the plan of salvation shall not be wrought out independent of human instrumentalities. Amen. God planned it for you to have a part in calling others. He has not chosen angels, but men of like passions, as ourselves to proclaim the gospel to the human race. It is important that all who have been partakers of this great salvation communicate to others that which has been made known to them. Review in Herald 1886. God has planned it that you have a part in the salvation of your fellow human beings. God could do it all by himself. If he wished to. But he doesn't want to. He wants you to have a part in laboring with him. So God, God calls out people for many reasons, two of which I will give you. One, he calls out people so that they can be saved. Your working for others enhances the prospects of you are being saved. Amen. Yes, yeah, like someone said yesterday in our board meeting, uh, he says, I could be a Christian as a monk in a cave. Maybe. But that's not God's will. God's will is that you come to him and then go and help others. The other reason he calls us is that he can use us as agents of salvation for others, other individuals. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, the Bible says... Um, that my spirit will not always strive with mankind. Now, the implication is that in that text is that God's spirit is going to strive with mankind for a while. We're part of that striving. And let me give you a couple of big words. There are two realities to that text. My spirit shall not always strive with mankind. There is an ontological reality and there is an eschatological reality. Now, actually, there's a third reality, but if I said that, I'd just be showing off. If I said that, there's also an epistemological reality. That's just showing off, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> but there are two realities. One is an ontological reality. That means that when the Bible says, my spirit will not always strive with mankind, it means that for you as an individual, God's not always going to work with you. Now, praise the Lord, he will work with you as long as you are alive. Amen. Amen. But 
sooner or later, you're going to die. There is nobody here, there's nobody walking the earth today, there's nobody alive who is beyond the reach of God. Do not worry yourselves unnecessarily about the unpardonable sin. If you're here today, you may not have a perfect life, but you are not beyond the reach of God. Amen? Amen. If you're bad, you can get good. If you're good, you can get better. And if you're better, you can get even better than that. Amen? Amen? Amen. So don't worry about unpardonable sin. That's not for you. That's not for now. Rid yourself of that. If you feel a little something going on in your heart, if you want to get better, if you want to hear the word of God, you're not too far for God to reach you. And even if you think you're beyond the reach of God, you probably are not. Amen? Amen. So that's the ontological reality. The, the other is the eschatological reality. That means that the Spirit of God is not always going to be here on the earth trying to convert people. Sooner or later, God is going to say, let him who is just be just still. Let him who is filthy be filthy still. Let him who is righteous be righteous still. Let him who is unrighteous be righteous still. Whatever you want, that's what you're going to get. So my spirit will not always strive, but for here and now, God's spirit is striving. And we are part of that striving. First Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 20 talks about the spirit of God or the, 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 of pre the preaching of the antediluvians to the spirits in prison, which simply means that those souls who were in prison to sin, God wanted to save them too. God has always wanted to save people. So Jonah now is called as an agent and arm of salvation. He is called to do God's bidding, just as you and I are called to do God's bidding. He is a prophet of God. He is a representative of God. More than a representative, he is a soldier in the army of God. But when God calls him to get up out of his comfortable house and go to the Assyrian community, Jonah refuses. We see Jonah as narrow, stubborn, hypocritical, and graceless. And he's a representative of the kingdom of grace. But more than that, his sin lay in not only the lack of godly love, for a dying and lost people, but an inordinate love of himself, his comfort, and his own world view. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the textbook definition for the Laodicean church. As a prophet now, he parallels the status of God's people today. Christ in his message to Laodicea has no, condom, no commendation. Did you know that? There are two churches to which he has nothing good to say. Sardis and Laodicea. Nothing good. Sardis, because they are hypocritical, he says, you look like you're alive, but you're really dead. And Laodicea, because... You're neither dead nor alive. You're lukewarm. The term Laodicea means a people judged, a people judged by God. And as God judged his prophet, so God is now judging his church. Listen to what Ellen White says. To those who are indifferent at this time, Christ's warning is because thou art lukewarm, Neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, if that were not bad enough, listen to what she says further. The figure of spewing out of his mouth means that he cannot offer up your prayers or your expressions of love to God. That's serious. Let me read it again. The figure of spewing out of his mouth means that he cannot offer up your prayers 
or your expressions of love to God. He cannot endorse your teaching of his word or your spiritual work in any wise. So if you're in a listless, backslidden, Laodicean, Laodicean condition, even your works in his behalf get you no credit. You know, Ellen White uses, uses the expression, I read this years ago, of a dishcloth. How a dishcloth cleans dishes while it, it itself is getting dirty. She says God can use the unconverted to convert folk. So just because folk are coming to the Lord through a particular preacher or preaching doesn't mean that God endorses that person. See, the power is in the word. And God can clean up others using a dirty rag. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get a rag that's dirty, you got two choices. Either wash the rag or throw it out. Yeah, use a towel one or two days. Then it's time to change the towel. Amen? Because as you're getting clean, what's happening to the towel? Yeah. So either wash the towel or get rid of it. So God can get clean results using imperfect instruments. By the way, if God had to wait for the church to be totally clean before he used it, the church would never get anything done. Not waiting for you to get perfect. In using you, he is perfecting you. Amen. Amen? Amen? So if you refuse to get used, yeah, if you, refuse, if you refuse to get used, you are getting dirty, and God's going to either have to wash you in hot water, by the way, <laughs> or throw you out. Amen. So he cannot endorse your teaching of his word or your spiritual work in any way. He cannot present your religious exercises with the request that grace be given you. That's rough. That's frightening. Sixth volume of the testimonies, page 408, paragraph 2. Could the curtain be rolled back? Could you discern the purposes of God and the judgments that are about to fall upon a doomed world. You know, this world is about to go through some stuff, ladies and gentlemen. The judgments of God are coming. So could you, could the curtain be rolled back? Could you discern the purposes of God and the judgments that are about to fall upon a doomed world? Could you but see your own attitude? You would fear and tremble for your own souls and for the souls of your fellow men. Earnest prayers of heart-rending anguish would go up to heaven. You would weep between the porch and the altar, confessing your spiritual blindness and backsliding. Again, Sixth volume of the Testimonies, page 408. So if we are indeed lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, and unacceptable to God in that state, if the Laodicean church is indeed a church devoid of commendation, what then was the relationship between God and Jonah when he was in the belly of that fish. And what if he had died in that fish? And what if he had died on the way to Tarshish? So the Bible says that Jonah cried out. So let me ask you a question. Who did he cry out for? 
Did he cry out for Nineveh? Mm -mm. Cried out for Jonah. He cried out for self. It was a selfish cry for deliverance. An argument could be proffered. An argument indeed could be made that running from the will of God and the un un unacceptable activity of Jonah parallels the miserable, spiritually blind, and naked Laodicean message. And aren't you glad that we serve a God who's always the same? I mean, seriously. He's being punished. He's in the belly of a fish. And he cries out for God, not that God would deliver him or, or deliver Nineveh. I just want to get out of this mess. Ellen White says, when Satan saw what his sin had done in heaven, uh, he felt bad. Didn't feel bad for heaven. Felt bad that he got kicked out. When we were kids, it was easy to get us to repent. When my father did this, <laughs> easy to repent. You know, when the hammer's going to come down, it's easy to get sorry when you're about to get yours. So Jonah now cries out for deliverance, not for Nineveh, for himself. And yet with that, God heard his plea. That's why I'm so glad I'm not God, Lewis. God has said, what you calling me now for? But God heard his plea. And I'm so glad that we serve a God. Every time you go to God, you get the same God. Amen. Every time. God never has a bad day. Amen. Because I'll tell you the truth. I do. Mm -hmm. I have days when I want to be bothered. And I have days I don't want to be bothered. Amen. amen. I said amen. amen. That's what I said. But God never has a bad day. Never has a bad day. And every time you go to God, you get the same God. And so Jonah selfishly calls out to God from the belly of a whale, not for the Ninevites, but for himself. God hears that prayer. And God delivers him. I wonder if it's going to take a whale of an experience to get the Adventist church where God wants it to be. To get us ready to do the work of God. Christ said of the Laodicean church, I wish that you are hot or cold. And that wish, the word is a felon, is not, it's not just I wish, it's, it's, you ought to be hot or cold. You must be hot or cold. You have to be hot or cold. The worst thing you can be in the, in the church of God is indecision. The indecisive. Decide. On or off. But not, not lukewarm. The Laodicean message, by the way, brothers and sisters, we are told in first, the Bible of the Testimonies, page 187, is an individual message. It's not a church message because everybody in the Laodicean church is not in the Laodicean condition. Praise God. Amen. There are some people who are on fire for the Lord. Amen. The problem is not enough people are on fire for the Lord. So the Laodicean message is an individual message. Galatians says, let a man examine himself to see whether we're in the faith. That's why most people come to church, they bring two tools, a rake and a shovel. And usually when folks are screaming amen, they got the shovel out. Church needs to get right. Amen, pastor. Amen. Shoveling it onto the person next to them, and you ought to have a rake. Amen, 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 amen. Using the wrong tool.
Here's what Ellen White says. It would be more pleasurable to the Lord if lukewarm professors of religion had never named the name of Jesus. That's hard. It would be more pleasurable to the Lord if lukewarm professors of religion had never named the name, named his name. They are a continual weight to those who would be faithful followers of Jesus. So for those who want to run, if you just shuffle in, they got to drag you with them. They are a stumbling block to unbelievers. The late C.D. Brooks used to say there are some people so useless, uh, God can't use them, and the devil doesn't even want them. <laughs> That's first volume of the Testimonies, page 188. They are a weight to believers and a stumbling block to unbelievers. So they're not helping the church, and they're keeping folk from coming in the church. Ellen White said that the Laodicean message is applicable to all who profess to be Christians. And James White repeated that statement in Review and Herald in 1856. Christ said, I would, you ought to be hot or cold. It is an obligation for you to decide whose side you're going to be on. And let me say this to you, Christians. Everybody, every Christian, sooner or later in your walk with Jesus, is going to have to answer the question, how much is Jesus worth to me? And it will determine if you will go forward or if you will just tread water. You got to answer that question. How much am I willing to sacrifice for the Lord? How much of my comfort am I willing to give up for the Lord? How much of my life am I willing to rearrange for the Lord? Every Christian will have to answer that question. It is a duty to be hot or cold. Jonah cried and prayed for himself not for the lost souls of Nineveh. He didn't care about them. Let me read you something from the book Evangelism. I date all my books. That's a habit I have. Put my name on the bottom and the date on the top. I bought this May 1st, 1973. A couple days ago. <laughs> Ellen White, this is page 34. I appeal to our brethren who live, who have heard the message for many years. It is time to wake up the watchmen. I have expressed my, I have expended my strength in giving the message the Lord has given me. The burden of the needs of our cities has rested so heavily upon me that it has sometimes seemed that I should die. That's powerful. Now, I've done evangelism over the years. I've done maybe 35 or 40 meetings. And I've done long evangelistic meetings. I've preached six, seven, eight weeks. I've started preaching right after the 4th of July and preached straight through to after Labor Day. Many times in New York City. I've preached so hard, I, pre I preached myself in the hospital on two occasions. Fasting and praying for souls and just, you're preaching, you're not eating, you're running back and forth on two occasions. Evangelism used to be my weight control when I was pastoring. I would lose 22 pounds every summer doing evangelism. So I could fatten up during the winter and lose it during the summer. <laughs> At least 30 meetings. I baptized my mom, my dad, my wife. Amen. Amen. Stepson, stepdaughter, and a lot of other folk. But I have never felt like I was going to die. I've never had that burden that I feel sometimes like I'm going to die. How about you? You figure you're going to die if you don't take the gospel to your next door neighbor? You feel like you're going to die if you don't share the gospel with the people that you work with? Or worse, people who consider themselves your enemy. Are you going to die if they don't get the gospel? I've never felt that. But I don't know why it says, I've, I've, I've agonized over the cities to the point I feel I'm going to die. 
And Jonah didn't feel like he was going to die for Nineveh. He prayed for Jonah. And was only concerned about Jonah. And praise God, the Lord graciously heard and answered his prayer. You see, brothers and sisters, God is undoubtedly blessing the church. There's no doubt that God is blessing the church. But that doesn't mean that the church is perfect. Doesn't mean that the church is not making mistakes. Doesn't mean the church can't do better. Doesn't mean the church has a ways to go. You see, the Laodiceans said to themselves, we are rich and increased with goods, and they were telling the truth. They were rich. They were increased with goods. But that thinking can get in the way sometimes. And otherwise says, don't neglect the warnings. Since you've got all of this stuff, don't let the stuff delude, delude you into thinking that you're perfect with God. Luke chapter 12, verse 15, a man's life does not consist of the things that he possesses. The goodness of the Adventist church does not consist of the stuff we got. Got a great educational system. Got a great hospital system. There's a blessing to the church, as is 3ABN. Amen. 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 I said amen. amen. That's what I said. Don't let that delude you into thinking that you don't need anything else. Christ is saying, beneath all of this stuff, you may be wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So Christ is calling us to a higher standard. He's calling us to gold tried in the fire. Translation, faith tested in the flames of affliction. We need our faith tested. Jonah bemoaned his fate, but did not reaffirm his faith. One of the things to be sorry, it is one thing rather to be sorry for the consequences of your sin, and quite another to be sorry for the sin itself, as itself. As children of God, we must be sorry for the sin itself. Satan says Ellen White, when he got jettisoned from heaven, we're sorry for the results, not for the sin. So now Jonah begins to preach. Praise the Lord. But his heart wasn't in it. And the reason we know that his heart wasn't in it is because when the people repented from the greatest to the least, when the revival that he wanted happened, Jonah got upset. Chapter 4, verse 10, we see what's going on in Jonah's mind. You see, if you have the mind of Christ and you preach Christ and people respond to your preaching, that ought to make you glad. Amen? When souls are turned away from destruction, you ought to be happy. But the Bible says in uh, Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, but it, dis it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Now, what kind of mind gets mad when God has mercy? You say, fear God, give glory to him, because judgment is coming, and the people fear God and give glory to him, and you all bent out of shape? Does that make sense? You got what you wanted and you ought to be happy and you ought to rejoice Acts chapter 17 verse 11 says the Lord takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked but rather that they turn from their sins amen that's repeated in 2nd Chronicles 7 Jeremiah 25 Zechariah 1 4 over and over again God doesn't get any kicks out of killing folk he wants them to turn and live 
So if you preach Christ and they turn and live, what's the problem? And so God had on Nineveh the same mercy that God had on Jonah. Amen? See, you've got to look at it that way. When you want God to punish your neighbor for doing bad stuff to you, you got to remember that maybe God is holding back the bad stuff on you for what you've done to somebody else. Amen? Amen? Amen. You know, I had a teacher in school. He used to tell us, um, and I didn't understand until I got out of, out of Oakland College, graduated with my, my degree. He used to say, as bad as it is to breathe secondhand smoke, it's worse to blow smoke up your own nose. And it took me years to understand that. So be honest with yourself. God forgives them just like God is forgiven you. So when God has mercy on them, remember it's the same God who's having mercy on you. Amen? Amen. So God has mercy on Nineveh and Jonah is upset. He says, that's why I didn't go in the first place. That's why, because I knew, I, see, I, I know you, God. I, I know you. I knew you were going to repent. I knew you were going to give them a break. I don't like those people anyway. I don't like them, and they don't like me. I knew you were going to do that. You're going to repent. You're going to make a liar out of me. You're going to forgive them and embarrass me. I wish I was dead. Sick of it. Preaching, 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 telling them that hell is going to come. It's going to be destroyed. And here you go. You repent, making me look bad. I just, I just want to die. I just, I wish I was dead. I knew you were going to pull some stunt like that. And it's interesting. Because there was someone else that said, just kill me, too. Interesting, interesting, interesting juxtaposition. Moses, in the wilderness, said the same thing to God. Lord, just kill me. Just kill me. But Moses was in response to God saying, this is a stiff-necked people. It's hard-headed. Why don't I just blot them out and start over with you? Moses said, no, don't do that. Kill me and let them live. Now Jonah says, okay, Lord, you didn't kill them, so kill me. You see the difference? One is somebody acting like Christ. The other is somebody acting like, mm -hmm, like the devil. Same words. But they're coming from two totally different perspectives. Moses is saying, save them, take me. Jonah is saying, if you're not going to kill them, you might as well kill me. Because I can't take it anymore. I can't take it, I can't take it. Just kill me, my life is over, I can't stand it. <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying, I'm so glad we serve, we serve the kind of God we serve. Because he asked two times in that conversation, he said, I want to die, just, just kill me. See, me, I would have given him what he wanted. <laughs> you ask me twice in the same conversation, I want to die, just kill me. Okay. <laughs> but aren't you glad we serve a merciful God? Amen. Who doesn't always give you what you want or even what you ask for. He gives you what you need. So God is, God is wrestling with this guy. This, 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 this ought to give us all hope because he's in God's face. Two times. Kill him. And then the Bible says he stomps out of the city and sits down on the ground to see if God will finally change his mind and kill them. He's mad. Sun beating down on him, and God still has mercy. During the night, God allows a plant to grow up. The Bible calls it a gourd. And there's some theological 
variance as to what it is, but it grew up big enough to cover him. And it grew up in one night. That's a miracle of God. You go to sleep one night, next morning, a plant's big enough to cover your whole body from the sun. And one night later, God has a worm kill that plant. It's another miracle. And now Jonah's hot. God, what is the matter with you? You killed my plant? It's my plant, man. That's my plant. You took out my plant. You, you saved them and you killed my plant? And then God says, what are you whining about? <laughs> you didn't plant that plant? Amen. You didn't water that plant? You didn't fertilize that plant? You had nothing to do with that plant. It's my plant. <laughs> so I sent a worm to kill the plant. Because I'm trying to get you to see yourself. You're in my face over a plant that I let die and you're angry over a whole nation that I let live. Amen. See, that's a warning to the Adventist church. Get your priorities straight. Amen. I was on the phone with a pastor the other day. He was asking for some counsel because he's got a little issue in his church. Folk up in arms over stuff, emails flying back and forth, Facebook, texts, all kinds of stuff. And I, I was telling him, if your people had the same energy to fight the devil, like they're fighting each other. I mean, you got hot texts flying back and forth, folk getting bent out of shape, elders walking out of meetings. You put that energy in fighting Satan. You fought the devil like you fight your brother and sister in church. Christ would have been here long ago. getting bent out of shape over a plant and of the whole world out there dying. And that's what's wrong with the Laodicean church. Lazy, listless, focused on the wrong things. Jesus is coming soon. And we're majoring in minor, and we've gotten our eyes off of Christ. That's why 3ABN has pivoted into frontline evangelism. Because there's no more time to sit and talk about doing the will of God or think about doing the will of God. It's time to do the will of God. Amen. Amen? And the Laodicean message, I repeat, is an individual message. Every member has to ask himself, Lord, is it I? Am I doing your will or am I not doing your will? And the sad truth of this book, you see how it ends. It just ends. It ends with a nation that is converted and a prophet who is not. It just ends. Nineveh is saved. Jonah is lost. The last line is him arguing with God. Where's my plan? I'm on my plan. And he didn't know that just beyond the walls, a whole nation had turned to God. And he's focused on a plan. And so God says, is it right for you to be mad? You know what Jonah's response is? Yep. Yeah, it's right for me to be mad. I'm so mad I could die. <laughs> That's the last thing he said to God. And the Bible ends the story right there. 
I wonder if he ever got right with God. I wonder if he ever came to his senses. I don't know. Let's ask God when we get to heaven. Amen? Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus.